We are pay, that's all. We are God in our history. Hey guys, that this is part 2 of what if Naruto was the Red Demon. The Red Demon left with the mist, as fast as light and as silent as a ghost. To most, he is known as the fastest man alive. To others, he was the silent twin. His red stare was able to paralyze any man it gazed on, but his devotion to his family was almost overwhelming. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe and check the author in the description. Let's start. Chapter 3 Next match, Namikaze Mikoto vs Sabaka no Gara. The proctor yelled from the center of the arena as the last two fighters were carted off on stretchers after a simultaneous double knockout. The sand user wasted no time appearing by the proctor in a sand body flicker, his eyes immediately went to his female opponent. The red-haired girl was busy searching the crowd until her eyes stopped at the Kage's box, straight into her father's soft blue eyes, he sent he a discreet thumb up. You can do it, Mikoto. I believe in you. The older Namikaze winced at the volume Rin had yelled in as she wildly flapped her arms around. The younger girl hesitantly smiled at her, then lastly her eyes went to her older brother, Naruto. Her fellow redhead looked at her with a small smirk on his face and nodded, at this she puffed out her chest and leaped over the edge of the competitor's box, landed on the ground solidly and stopped barely even a foot away from her opponent, Gara. Her new claymore was sheathed on her waist and she idly kept her left hand on the handle, preparing for a draw if necessary. The Jounin Proctor looked between them and noticed the tension that passed in their midst them. He sighed tiredly and prepared his mind to call up more medics after the match. You are not afraid of me. Gara stated as he crossed his arms. Why? My big brother says that fear is only in the mind. Overcoming it in there, she tapped the side of her temple, then gesturing outwards means you can overcome it out here. Then he's a fool. Mikoto bared her teeth in rage at the insult to her precious older brother as she tightly squeezed the handle of her new weapon till her knuckles turned white. Then she remembered the advice her brother had given her a month ago in the forest of death. Don't let your emotions control you. She smoothed the emotion off her face and smiled widely at the red head across from her with her eyes closed. A repulsively devious of false expression if Gara had ever seen one. I'll make you regret saying that. I promise. Gara frowned deeply and glared at her. And I promise to grind your bones to nothing with my sand. Let the red demon watch. This time he cast a look to the Hokage's box, to Naruto. The red demon stared back, his arms crossed and a glimmering frown tickling at the corners of his emotionless face. He didn't break eye contact, and the Kazakage's son felt something in him froth. Gara spat at the ground. Enough. The proctor cut in and took a step back as the two genin looked at him with underlying bloodlust in their eyes, Gara's rage being more physical than Mikoto's. Mikoto Namikaze vs Sabaka no Gara. Begin. Not even seconds later, tendrils of sand shot out from the boy's gourd to the girl. Mikoto leaped back twice and flipped dexterously over a sand tentacle that attempted to snag her leg. She clenched her teeth as she unsheathed her four-foot-long claymore with both hands, sparkling with silver and black metal and drove the weapon clean through the sand as she touched down. Wind release, pulse. The counterattack created a ball of air on the end of the blade, and this ball of chakra expanded over her, exploding outwards and pushing the sand away from her in a billowing gale of sharp heat and violent wind. Not letting the miniature cyclone to subside, Mikoto ducked her head and ran through the wind to the red head with her sword flying in her hand behind her, hidden by the dust and sand in the air. She skidded on her knees under a blind swing from a sand tendril and used the slide to turn around. Gara looked at her over his shoulder, bored being the dominant emotion in his murky eyes, watching his opponent spin like a top in a tight circle and swinging her large sword at him for another attack. Water release, pulse. As her blade smashed against the imperial sand defense on his back water blasted from the sides of the blade, bathing the sand boy and her. Gara's eyes widened in horror as his sand became limper after the single attack. The water kept on pouring from the blade and the girl held on strong as each wave splashed from the blade over them, flooding the arena. The seals on the edges of the blade that glowed blue began to flicker, eventually flipping off and the water stopped flowing out. She savagely kicked his back forward and he flew through the air, hitting the wall and falling back into the waist-height water in the arena. 
Air bubbles floated up and popped where he lay. The boy lay blissfully in the water, his sand soaked so much that they didn't budge under his command and the red-haired girl walked on the surface of the water to him, cautious, her claymore in both of her hands and ready for any surprise. In his semi-unconscious state, he wondered just how much the girl had prepared for their encounter, no one ever thought to use this much water against him, it being why he succeeded on missions. Each drop of water that his opponent sent could be distributed among his sand so thoroughly that it essentially made the sand stronger and not heavier. But Mikoto had neutralized the biggest weapon in his arsenal by simply flooding the arena. His lungs began burning for air and he tried to will his limp arms to move, but they remained heavy as stone. He couldn't even open his eyes. It might have been shock that had him bested so quickly and so easily, or it could have been an underlying fear for the girl. A memory. Nine months ago, one day before Lord Red Demon Week, his father, the Kazakage, had commanded that he lie down on an operating table so that Naruto could administer the beast containment seals his father had given him but he had refused and went berserk. They were far away in the same cave the One Tails had been sealed in so they weren't worried about the civilian populace being injured. He had been halfway to being full Shikaku and ready to use all the sand in the desert, spread out for miles and miles around, to destroy Sunagakir and his father. That is, until Naruto stopped the older red head from acting and opted to try his luck against him. The ghost speed user opened a water satchel and squirted the contents into the air, he then moved his right hand, palm open, so quickly that the spray of water collected back together into a smooth water sphere. He then used his other hand to flash through a chain of fifty hand seals quickly and muttered a low jutsu. Water release, black water vortex. The sphere of water that levitated in his speedily moving right hand then spun within itself. This was when he began running at him with double high down in speed so that he could concentrate of the spinning ball of water in his hands, running directly on each sand attack that was shot at him. Before Gara even knew it the spinning ball of water was thrown at him, much too close for him to dodge but he did raise a wall of sand to block. The water expanded, moving like an octopus, over the scorching hot sand and over the desperate sand user till he was basically in a large bubble of water that spun within itself like a washing machine. He was thrown around in the bubble violently for five minutes before the air in his lungs ran out and he passed out. The jutsu was an A-rank Namikaze ninjutsu only ghost speed users were capable of using. It wasn't regularly used since it consumed more than half of the user's chakra. Naruto was only still standing since he was part Uzumaki, his heritage from that clan was a massive well of chakra. Plus, ghost speed users were rare so that jutsu was locked away deep in the Namikaze's jutsu vault in their clan compound. It was possibly the fastest and easiest he had ever been incapacitated, and that sobered him up really quick. Till this second, it still haunted his every waking days, that there was a single individual out there that was so strong he could toy with him. If he had resorted to using all the sand in the desert, his father might find it difficult to restrain him. It was possible that since the very instant they had been paired against each other, that the Namikaze prodigy knew how to take him down. He didn't believe she would resort to asking her older siblings on tips on how to disable him. That fact alone scared him, as a small bubble of air slipped out of the side of his lips and his red hair swayed with the water, and he couldn't remember the day he had ever been scared of anyone, except with Makoto's older brother and his father. The water around him bubbled as the thought of him fearing the youngest Namikaze settled in his mind. Toxic red chakra leaked out from his body and slowly spread around him. If he was going to go down, he would go down fighting with everything he had in him. Even though he was too soaked in chakra water to fully summon the one tails, he would do what he could to fulfill his promise to the Namikaze. The boy's eyes snapped open and his pupils dilated to a tiny dot as red veins pulsed from the edge of his eyeballs. He roared from his underwater weight prison and the water exploded upwards like a geyser, forcing Makoto to surf on the water to get closer to the center, her right hand tightly holding her claymore. Her feet left tiny ripples on the water as she ran head first into the tall geyser in the middle of the arena, but she quickly dodged a normal-sized brown arm that shot out from the geyser at her, sopping wet and mucky. She grunted as the fist hit her square in the face and another met her unprotected stomach, the last one clipped her left cheek. Blood spewed out of her mouth as she careened and bounced on the water. She didn't allow her body to slow down before she got her hands under her and flipped three times, deftly landed on the wall and flipped forward once back onto the water. Small ripples flowed out from under her feet as she landed. She rolled her neck painfully, the crack making the collectively audience wince, and she ran her left sleeve over her mouth to clean up the blood. It smeared it down her chin. 
Her eyes were fixed on the now settling spout of water, at the new gara, he was now encased in a wet sand body that was deep brown from the water. His head was covered in this sand leaving his lower face. There were lines and cracks running through his body, sealing Fuenjutsu that carefully controlled the demon chakra flowing through his body. Hand-to-hand -hand wasn't his best fighting ability but he was passable in that aspect, Mikoto deduced. She didn't know that the armor, although providing a greater defense and eventual offense once a blow connected, was very slow. Your son can still use his bloodline with all that water soaked in his sand. Minato asked the older Kage beside in bewilderment. He has been training to ever since Naruto left Suna. The man replied, But how is that possible? The weight of his sand should be impossible for one his age. Kamina, leader of Hidden Marsh, asked skeptically. Gara has always hated being weak, the weight of the sand and water is nothing. My only concern is on how long he would be able to hold it up, especially with all that beast chakra he's using. Naruto muttered with his eyes narrowed. Question is, would Mikoto use her own tailed beast as well? We'll just have to wait and see. Minato replied his male bodyguard. Mikoto did something that surprised the audience, she stabbed her claymore into the water and the handle stuck out of the water to show that it was indeed sheathed in the earth. Everyone held their breaths in anticipation as the youngest Namike's prodigy cracked her fists and discarded her claymore sheath next to her claymore. It splashed on the water and sank. The proctor looked between them, standing a little bit away from their fight, and gulped as the water began to slowly churn within itself. Mikoto and Gara though didn't move with the water. The proctor made sure he was securely stuck to the wall. Suddenly the girl bent down and began running forward, her footsteps making a low pitter pattering sound as they hit the water. The audience remained silent as they watched the girl close the distance between her and the Kazakage's youngest son. Her right fist shot forward as she almost got to the boy, who remained unmoving, and the crowd erupted into crowing cheers as a wet sandy wall erupted from in front of him. Her fist smashed against the wet wall and it blasted inwards. She kept up her onslaught until a sandy arm pushed through the wall on the other side and nailed her face, she ducked the next blow and, with a yell of effort, punched the self-replenishing wet sand wall. Haya. Boom. As the wall crumbled Gara wasted no time to dart to her with a head but to her temple and a knee to her stomach, which was countered with her own knee. She slid around him and palms struck his back between his shoulder blades. The resounding thud echoed over the noisy crowd and she just barely leaned to her right as a sharp tendril shot from his neck, scratching her cheek lightly in the process. Though a dozen sand fists shot out from underneath her and punched her right under her chin, lifting her off the ground and slapping back onto the water. Gara raised both of his hands into the air and a wall of water-soaked sand slowly rose behind him. He growled as Mikoto painfully got back to her feet, she grabbed her chin and winced at the pain throbbing in it. Stay down. The boy screamed and the sand wall divided into hundreds of poles that almost reached as high as the open roof of the arena. Each pole swelled up at the tips to form boxing gloves, following the action of Gara's bald fists. Ten thousand sand fists of doom. His scream echoed over the uneasy noise of the crowd. Mikoto looked on with one eye open and a mouthful of blood pouring down her chin at the incoming sand fists. Without looking Minato raised his hand for Naruto to stand down. No. Let her fight her own battles. The boy grit his teeth and grudgingly stood down. Rin though looked unworriedly as the fists got even closer to her sister but sighed in relief as the Tamikoto that was savagely punched exploded into a puff of chakra. Smoke. Gara looked around with his eyes wide and found his opponent standing further back than her dispelled clone. Both of her eyes open and still having a smear of her blood on her chin, her clothes were still intact, merely soaked. The sand user commanded the fists to return to him and they hovered over his shoulder, watching as the girl slapped her palms together, then into the ram hand seal. Uzumaki chakra chains. She said, much to the shock of everyone, especially the other team senseis. She can use chakra chains. Kurinai muttered hotly to the masked sensei, the man I smiled back at her. Of course she can. She is an Uzumaki. He said it like he was talking to a toddler. But Naruto and Rin are not able to use the Uzumaki's chakra chains. Guy asked slowly. Mikoto's chakra is dense enough to form long chains for an extended period of time, especially since she has the Kyubi. But the twin's chakra is only dense enough for chakra construction. Kakashi explained. Chakra construction. Ino Yamanaka, heiress of the Yamanaka clan. 
questioned as she watched three dozen golden chakra chains slither out from the youngest Namike's back but somehow not tearing her combat uniform. These chains waved like snakes in the air around Makoto, their tips turning into sharp speared tips. What's that? It was Asuma that explained it to the waiting Genin, even the visiting Genin listened in. Chakra construction is when the chakra of the person is dense enough to create objects, like weapons and even clothes. It's not like combining the yin and yang chakra since with chakra construction, the creations remain the color of the person's chakra and isn't exactly, what's the word? Permanent. Is that why the red sun are so strong? They are able to create weapons at will. Another Kanoha sensei asked the late Sandame son, creating a weapon is one thing, using it well is another. The legendary copy ninja continued. He then entered teacher mode. You see, Uzumaki Kushina sensei was one of the greatest Uzumaki of her time. And since she was born from that clan, she had extremely dense chakra, dense enough to make thousands of chains that were able to hold down the nine-tailed beast. This dense chakra watered down a little in the twins, only allowing them to chakra construct objects, mostly short to mid-distance objects, rather than full-on chains. Depending on the chakra capacity and density, the chakra chains could extend really, really far. Can they make throwing weapons then? Ten Ten asked as she watched the chakra chains of the Namike's girl clash against the sand fists of the sand user. The chains drilled through the sand and wrapped around the red-haired boy, who looked on with wide, horrified eyes as his attack was nullified. I mean, since they can't use chakra construction for long distances. That's different. I haven't heard them using things like chakra shuriken before. I'll just say that it wouldn't be as strong as the real shuriken if it flies too far from them. Kakashi said as he scratched his chin. He watched as Mikoto forcefully broke apart the boy's sand armor by squeezing it and grinding it with barbed spikes on the golden chain. That's a reason why people call Rin, the angel of Kanoha, and Naruto, the red demon, they can use chakra construction to create wings and they can fly with them. But rarely, they can fly. Sakura shouted. Yes, but not usually. Naruto said it was because flying was too showy, it was more of Rin's thing, Kurinai responded. And to think they couldn't get any stronger. She muttered to herself. Same. Kakashi sighed. I'm so proud. His eye watered and he sniffed. You're doing great, Mikoto. He shouted into the arena and sent the girl a thumb up. The young Namikaze dragged the Kazakage's son to her and held him off the ground just in front of her. Her face was emotionless to the way he struggled against the chakra draining chains. She clenched her teeth and swallowed hard to hold in the anger that wanted to pour out, trying with all her might to suppress the bloodlust that originated from her tailed beast seal. She forced the boy to look into her eyes as she spoke. Take it back. She said it so quietly, the crowd lessened their noise but only a little to hear what she had said. Take back what you said about my brother. Fuck you. Gara spat and his head cracked to the right at the earth-shattering punch the girl gave him, he turned back to her and spat again. Another blow met his other cheek. The barbed chains kept digging into his back, squeezing him tighter and tighter with each punch that broke him down. He could feel his cheek splinter after the next blow and his left eye close after the one after that. His lip split open after another blank-faced blow from the girl and blood mixed with spit dribbled from his lips after the next one. Breathing became harder as the chains squeezed him tighter and darkness circled around his eyes with each continued blow. Temari and Kankuro could only watch in horror as their undefeatable brother at the mercy of the Namike's prodigy. Worry grew in them with each small twitch of his leg, movement became shorter and they could barely see him breath until the proctor finally called the match in the young girl's favor. They wasted no time to jump into the arena and catch their younger brother as the girl threw him at them. Medic. We need a medic. The proctor yelled and four medics ran in to attend to the limp Kazakage's son. Mikoto numbly watched as the medics frantically tried to sustain the life of the young boy, who was now a bloody, broken mess of flesh, bone, sand and clothes. She hastily walked to him but the older sand siblings barred her from coming any closer, the sheer hate and fear in their eyes was almost overwhelming. Kankuro growled. Don't come any closer, you've done enough. I I am sorry, the girl whispered and tried to reach forward past them but Tamari cut her off. Just, just go. The blonde girl said and turned around worriedly as her brother was gently set on a stretcher. Please. Go. She said quietly and the red-haired girl's shoulder slumped. I'm sorry. She said as she ran off the arena. 
Mikoto, wait. Sakura shouted and ran after her crying teammate down to the lower levels of the arena. Naruto pursed his lips and looked at his father, the man smiled faintly and nodded in the general direction the young redhead had run to. The ghost speed user exhaled gratefully before he told his sister. Make sure Gar is okay. The girl nodded at his order and both leaped over the railing of the Kage's booth. As Naruto's feet hit the floor he looked to where his eternal rival, Itachi, sat with the rest of the Uchiha clan, and the Uchiha nodded shortly before he looked at the Yandame. The informal switch of guards had been made but only until the bloody sun returned to their posts. Don't you think it's unwise to send out both of your guards? The Kazakage droned, not showing much disturbance at the brutality of the last fight. The Chunin exam is being hosted in my village. I don't really need bodyguards. He answered as he looked on as Gara was slowly carried off on a stretcher over the tall water by Medic's water walking on its surface. Meanwhile Rin, the gentler half of the Red Sun, spoke soothingly to Gara's older siblings, gradually making them drop their guard around her and allow her a little bit closer to their broken younger brother. Naruto simply pulled out his sister's claymore, sheathed it and clipped the sheath to his right hip as he exited the main arena. It was after Naruto had smiled with his eyes at him did Gara finally pass out into blissful unconsciousness. The hunter jogged after the small chakra he sensed in front of him, knowing that it was Sakura. He found the girl knocking against a door to a room and stopped when she saw Naruto coming up to her. She won't come out. He nodded and pressed his ear to the door to hear what was going on. No sound. Mikoto, are you okay? Leave me alone. Was the muffled reply. I'm your brother it's my job to bug you. He expected even a small laugh but he didn't hear any. Sakura nervously waited for the girl to open the door. I'm not leaving, Miko Miko. Her eyebrows shot into her hairline at the unfamiliar name for her teammate and she was surprised when the door cracked open a little to show just a single, sky blue eye. I told you to stop calling me that. The girl mumbled tearfully. I'm not a kid anymore. She looked like she was about to cry any second. Naruto's purple eyes softened and he smiled gently at the girl. You're always going to be my baby sister, Mikoto. That would never change. The girl's lips wobbled and tears began falling from her eyes as she threw the door open to lunge into her big brother for a tight hug. The tears increased as her arms tightened around his back, she refused to cry loudly. The older redhead patted her back. Sakura, can we please have some privacy? Mikoto's my friend. It's fine, Sakura, I'll catch you later. Mikoto's voice was muffled against the boy's flak jacket protected belly as she kept her eyes clenched shut. The pink-haired girl nodded curtly and walked off. The older Namikaze remained standing straight as he patted the girl's back while she, yet to be as tall as him, stayed where she was. I don't know what came over me, I just got so mad when he insulted you. He didn't wince when she hugged him tighter but relaxed a second later. The boy's eyebrows rose a little at what she said. It's not your fault. Yes, it is. I could have stopped myself but I didn't, I, I just wanted him to take back what he said about you. She exclaimed and looked at him, before she again pushed her face into his belly. I'm sorry I didn't live up to my promise, big bro. Naruto's lips twitched upwards in mild amusement. I once broke a man's back for calling Rin an idiot. He stated abruptly and suppressed a grin when she looked up at him again, her mouth gaping in shock. Well, he wasn't really a man, per se, more like a demon but eh, when did that happen? Demon country. He answered shortly. Have you read about the history of our clan? Of course I have, Big Sis taught it to me when I was four. If you really studied our clan history, you'll notice that we are very territorial and protective of our family, even against seemingly small insults. Hell, father severely injured the current Suchikage's back during the last war when he called his older cousin a ditz, and we all know late Aunt Kumi was a little ditzy. He winked at her and the girl giggled quietly, hiding her red face in his stomach. None of them had exactly met Kumi Namikaze, rather he had heard stories of her from his father. Funny stories. I'm proud of you for protecting my honor, Miko Miko. Thank you, bro she beamed at him. He pinched her cheeks and ruffled her straight hair, laughing at her childish groan. No problem. Now, I think you should be getting back to the arena, your next match is close. He returned her claymore and she attached it to her hip. They both began walking back to the contestant's booth. He idly asked. 
so how was using your claymore? Much better than the katana actually. For some reason, I can carry it better than I did with the katana. Is that weird? She had selected the claymore when she went weapon shopping with her older sister. She personally drew the chakra affinity storage seals all over the blade, and had been assured by the shop owner that there was already a durability seal on it. Her job was just to properly maintain the weapon. Naruto shook his head. Not at all, it just means that heavy weapons are more your style. He flicked his right wrist and a dark, eight-foot-long pole spun out of his palm. He hit the base on the ground and a misty red scythe blade shot from the top, it was about two and a half feet long. He twirled the scythe in his hand and it made a whooshing sound. Like with this scythe for me, I'm not a weapons master but I can hold my own with any light-handed weapon. Your sister prefers heavy weapons, like broad swords, battle axes, bludgeons, you know. He stopped spinning the black and red chakra construction scythe and it burst into red mist, floating back into Naruto's palm. Can I ever use chakra construction? Mikoto asked as she strained to form her own weapon but only three gold chains coiled out of her wrist. Naruto chuckled lightly. Your chakra chains are much better than my chakra construction, trust me. Your chains can go to any distance at breathtaking speeds, while I can only use short to mid distance. Since your chakra is denser than mine, it's stronger than mine. But, you're so much better than me. You're still a growing kid, you've got time to learn how to use it better. They stopped at the stairs that led up to the contestant's booth and the red-haired girl quickly hugged her brother one more time before she ran up the stairs. See you later, bro. And before she forgot. And thanks again. Every other match seemed to pale against the Hokage's youngest child versus the Kazakage's youngest child, except probably the fight between Sasuke Uchiha and Niji Hyuga. That fight had ended with the young Uchiha victorious but with painful pin-like marks on his body where his tenketsu had been poked. He had only dodged this by switching with a log that was riddled with explosive tags. After an hour-long intermission agreed on by the village leaders, the exams continued, with the Namike's genin being the first to be called to fight against. Kabuto smirked at the way the girl glared at him, expecting him to be intimidated. He didn't expect her to stop in front of him and thrust her hand forward for a handshake. I hope we have a good fight, Mr. Kabuto. He looked down at the hand once and slapped it away. Don't worry kid, I won't beat you too hard. The girl closed the formerly offered hand, closing it into a fist and popping the knuckles. With visible restraint, she took a step back. Proctor. She said. All right, Mikoto Namikaze vs. Kabuto Yakushi. Begin. Every spectator expected the girl to draw her weapon, it was what they usually came to expect of her in her fights. This time, Mikoto didn't unsheathe her claymore. Rather, she ran headfirst to the older teen as he began monologuing. I'm not sure what you expect to do again. He was silenced when her fist wafted past his face. He smirked cockily but never expected the knee that had been covered by the initial fist to smash against his ribs. KSSH. He limped away from the girl and she patiently stayed where she was, watching him nurse his bruised ribs with a bright smile on her face. She ran to him when he started talking again. That was a lucky. He bent under a spinning kick, leaned back from two solid kicks to his neck, slid to his left from an axe kick but was blindsided when a clone erupted from directly under him, nailing his chin squarely and bursting into thick white chakra smoke. Yumi Cho, leader of Hidden Chill, smirked when she realized the girl's plan. She used the dispelled clone's smoke to cover his senses. Chakra smoke from a dispelled clone still carried the chakra of the user until it thinned in the air and returned, but it was a sure way to confuse a sensor. Sadly, shadow clones took a lot of chakra to make, this was why people rarely used them for this reason. Mikoto leaped into the smoke as she drew her claymore, disappearing a moment later from their eyes. They could hear sounds of combat, particularly the sounds of metal slicing through flesh and muffled yells of pain. There were five more puffs of smoke, showing that she had summoned more clones and Kabuto had made the mistake of dispelling them, thickening the chakra smoke around him even more. Finally, they could hear the distinct sound of multiple knives sliding through a human body before the smoke was gratefully blown away. They could see Kabuto, barely even standing, with two kunai deep in his armpits, two through each thigh and calf, two through each lower arm, two in his sides, two in his shoulders and one hilted in his belly. Chuji gulped at the sight. Mikoto sure is brutal. Shikamaru unconsciously nodded in agreement. 
The Namikaze then finished Kabuto off by kicking him face first into the ground and held another kunai blade pointed down, tipped to his neck, pressing it in so that it drew a little blood. The knives in his limbs hindered any movement he wanted to make, grinding into his bones with every breath he took. The blade digging into his neck wasn't helping matters either. He closed his eyes in defeat as Mikoto was named the winner. He had made the mistake of underestimating her and she capitalized on it. Rin cheered without shame. Go, Mikoto. The medic could feel the blood lust of his master digging into the back of his head as he shuddered, struggling to breathe or even move. He was hoisted onto a stretcher by the medics, loathing the pitiful looks they gave him and he was taken through the tunnel. Before the tunnel could fully envelope him, he spared a look at the young, victorious Namikaze and frowned sharply at her grin. She sent him a finger-wiggling wave as she sheathed her claymore into the sheath on her hip smoothly. Something was wrong. He could feel it. Something was definitely wrong. The medics lugged the immobile medic through the door and he was immediately furrowed his eyebrows when he noticed the lone occupant of the room. The Kanoha medics bowed to the person and shuffled out of the medical ward silently, clicking the door shut. The matter was made worse when he realized that the weapons were still digging into his joints, paralyzing him. Why the hell didn't he notice that the medics haven't even taken them out yet? The other shinobi in the medical ward looked at him blankly, his spiky blood red hair seemed menacing as the light streamed through the window and hit him. The young man was in a pair of pitch black long sleeved shirt and pants that stopped at his ankles. His white sandals ended at his ankles and some white bandages around the middle of his right thigh. He had the standard forest green Kanoha Jounin vest and his forehead protector was wrapped on his right upper arm. There was a scary looking, long red and black tonto that was leaning against the chair he sat on, safely sheathed in its black holder. He was fingering the handle of the deadly weapon, which itself had a twin that wasn't present. Naruto hummed, tipping his head to the side. He allowed Kabuto to feel the killer intent he was focusing primarily on him, created and mastered from years of pain and experience. A killer intent that was one of the many, many reasons he was called the Red Demon. The silver-haired man's teen's eyes widened silently as a hovering beast formed directly behind the S-ranked red-haired Namikaze, the creature was misty red. Bearing the jagged mandibles of a mantis on a mask most would affiliate with the god of death, the Shinigami. In its right hand was a long, curved scythe that was leveled on Kabuto. The mask slowly cracked, bit by bit, to reveal that under it was nothing. An empty, hollow nothing. Vacant of light and sound, yet pulling in the light and sounds of the world around it. The nothing under the mask churned within itself into a vacuum, getting stronger and faster. Looking deep into the spinning red vortex on the face of the killer intent manifestation, it was already too late for the medic to look away. He could feel his very soul being pulled out of his body, he could feel fiery hot fingers stab though his chest and grab his soul by the neck, strangling it with savage strength and slowly drawing it out when it began to get limp. The real Kabuto, meanwhile, was convulsing. Sweat soaked his clothes, his eyes were wide and bloodshot. Petrified to the very core by the tremendous amount of power he was witnessing from the fastest person on the planet. Naruto slightly cocked his head to the other side curiously as he observed the terrified man vibrate from the illusion he combined with his killer intent. His Sharingan spiraled slowly to a stop when the other teenager's heart rate spiked dangerously. The pulling force that was applied to his soul ceased, but the fist that was wrapped around its neck didn't let up, suffocating him in ways he could never even imagine. He had heard stories about the Red Demon and how he had once taken down a whole band of A-ranked missing ninjas with a glance. Reports said that a sole survivor kept screaming about how the Shinigami's right hand was coming to finish him off. He didn't imagine it was this harsh facing off against Naruto's killer intent, not even his strength, and he had already forfeited his life at his hands. He had helped Orochimaru heal from the last time he had faced the Ghost Flash twins and he had resolved to stay as far away from them as possible but his fate was sealed. The moment the sound messenger didn't return to Orochimaru with his response, not that he knew that. The red void continued to slowly spin on the phantom's face as Naruto stood up and walked to Kabuto. He stopped at his side, the void-faced phantom followed suit and looked over Naruto's shoulder. The Sharingan user forced the haunted man by his neck and forced him to look into his jujitsu, he said a few short words to the man. Tell me all you know about the Otokage. The man gulped and hesitated for a few minutes but the phantom looked more over Naruto's shoulder at the medic. When he again witnessed the nothing face of death, Kabuto immediately felt his soul being dragged out even more, close to fully leaving his body, before it was pushed back violently into his body. He blinked numerous times after this and gulped thickly before his mouth opened and everything poured out. 
Naruto smirked a little as every secret concerning hidden sound, its occupants, its dealings, and Orochimaru sped out of the hyperventilating man's mouth at a fervent pace. Oh, 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 something was wrong. This thought ran through Orochimaru's head as he hastily looked around for his loyal assistant. He refrained from growling, fearing that he would attract the attention of the others in the box with him. His arms were crossed tightly as he scanned the crowd for any silver hair. He looked around until his eyes accidentally fell on the blonde Namike's twin, Rin. The girl looked at him harmlessly and leaned to him. Is there something wrong, Mr. Bumi? She stood protectively behind her father, the Yandame Hokage, like every other guard and patiently waited for her twin brother to return. The hidden sand ninja shook his head and spoke in a gruff voice, a close imitation to the real Bumi's tone. It must have been something I ate. The girl nodded sympathetically. I know what you mean. Sushi goes right through me, you know. She said it familiarly, even adding a tittering laugh that attracted the attention of a few other guards but not her father for some reason. But the Sanmi knew she had an underlying meaning for her words. He changed the topic when he sensed this. Where is your brother? I didn't even notice him leave. She shrugged. We Namikes have a way of speaking so fast no one notices, Lord Hokage sent him to tell the kitchen crew to prepare for the intermission. The disguised man nodded slowly, not buying her excuse. When the Namikaze didn't return, even after the intermission had run out, alarm bells rang through his head. The short look the Hokage shared with the Kazakage put him on edge, this was after the blonde Kage had finished reading an incredibly short letter. And he did it so quickly he didn't have time to peek in to read as well. He was aware that Kanoha and Suna were on good relations. Despite the age gap between the Hokage and Kazakage, the respective village leaders held the utmost respect for each other. There were Suna ninjas all over Kanoha and likewise in Suna. Relations between them were at an all-time high. Why the hell did he disregard this and willingly request to be part of the Kage's guard, disguised as another sand ninja, rather than enter as a team sensei? He was snapped out of his frantic musings by the village leader he had assigned himself to. Bumi. Yes, Lord Kazakage. Can you go and fetch my handkerchief from my room? Minato snorted quietly when he heard this. Handkerchief? Really? That's the best you could come up with, the sand leader looked at the leaf leader sharply, telling him to shut up with eyes alone. Hi, Lord Kazakage. He said mechanically, do you want me to help you out? Handkerchiefs can be hard to find sometimes. Rin proposed slowly, also wondering why the old Kage chose to use the handkerchief excuse. No. I can find it. Orochimaru, already catching up to what they wanted to do. They would all die trying. He was confident that he was able to take one half of the ghost flash, but prevention was always better than cure, better to avoid confrontation for the time being. As he left the Kage's booth, his plan was to make beeline to the west gate then back to Hidden Sound, he didn't catch the nod in his direction. Or even when Uchiha Itachi nodded curtly and excused himself from among his clan mates, no one the wiser except a few perceptive people in the arena including Uchiha Mikoto. Oh, 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 the streets were deserted as Orochimaru removed the false skin over his head, he hissed in irritation at how his invasion plans had been blown to smithereens. He had been receiving regular reports from the camp stationed outside Kanoha, but it was only when he had eavesdropped on a conversation on when numerous camps were destroyed all around Kanoha. The plan was for Kabuto to put a genjutsu over the arena and for him to use a jutsu to push away the village leaders and guards, leaving Minato alone and with no reinforcements. It was a flawless plan in his eyes, how did it all fall apart so easily? Especially when he realized that he had been receiving dummy letters from the supposed camps around Kanoha for the past three weeks. Was it old age that had made him overconfident? He finished shedding the skin of the man he had killed three weeks prior, after the beginning matches of the third stage of the Chunin exams. Doing so revealed his usually pale skin, as opposed to the tanned appearance of Bumi the late San Shinobi. He quickened his pace but stopped abruptly, dozens of feet away from his destination, when a chakra signature blinked behind him, clearly wanting him to know of his presence. He turned to the person and scowled, another person that had bested him in a fight. I would have thought that blonde brat would have sent his strongest shinobi after me. Not the dregs. He wanted to get under Itachi's skin but was failing. Itachi remained impassive as his coal black eyes stared down the snake summoner. I don't remember being a dreg when I left you half dead in grass country. He didn't show it facially but he savored the hatred the man was giving him. It always seemed that with every generation the ninjas were getting stronger and stronger, 
he remembered a time when he was the strongest of the San Nin, now he looked hopeless. He shook the thought out of his head, he wouldn't be beaten so easily again, Itachi can try, what do you want brat? I'm busy. He said as he crossed his arms tightly, I was ordered by Lord Hokage to bring you back, dead or alive. He doesn't really mind either way. The A-ranked Uchiha leaned back in the lazy slump and looked at Orochimaru with bored, half-lidded eyes. Which do you prefer, Orochimaru? You made the mistake of not coming with reinforcements, brat. He said as he ignored the question and flipped through two hand seals with a wicked smirk on his face. Explosive clone technique. Itachi cursed when he heard this and time slowed down. His eyes transformed into his three Tomo Sharingan and they morphed into the Mangekyo Sharingan. His vision saw the body of the Sanin bloat up at a super snail's pace, he saw the faint movement of chakra building up in the clone's stomach. He closed his left eye and whispered. Kamui, an almost invisible vortex of air erupted from his right eye and covered the explosion that was to happen, swallowing it whole and leaving just black scorched ground. A small shock wave shook through the immediate area. He closed both of his eyes as a single small drop of blood fell from his right eye, far away in the forest of death an explosion went off. He sighed in frustration. Lord Minato won't like this. He didn't look when he heard a low buzzing next to him. Naruto materialized from the blurry red haze, like he had stepped out of a portal, looking to where the Sanin had escaped. You really should stop using that jutsu, I'm sure your doctor said not to do that. Itachi waved off his concern. I'm fine. Do you have a lock on his chakra? He wiped the drop of blood away and Naruto narrowed his eyes, looking to where the Sanin escaped to. Since the very first day I met him, yes. Naruto replied as his own Sharingan activated. Do you want to capture him too? Of course I do. I can't let you have all the glory. He looked at his longtime friend from the corner of his eyes with his now both open eyes. A small, near identical smile grew on their faces, that was when Naruto noticed that Itachi still had his Mangekyo activated. Think you can keep up. And he was swallowed up in a Kemui. Naruto's eyebrows twitched when he realized that Itachi had, once again, cheated in a simple foot race. Oh, we'll see who gets to him first. He got into a start sprinting position and the air hummed in anticipation of what he was about to do. Chakra started gathering from his calves and spreading throughout his body before he released the tension in his body abruptly and shot forward. He disappeared in a haze of transparent air half a second later. Oh, oh, oh. it was always strange how Naruto had red-black chakra instead of the usual blue, just like how Rin had yellow-white chakra. Studies on their strange-looking chakra told them that they also acted differently. The first thing that came to mind was that Naruto and Rin were the first in recorded history to have the chakra construction ability, which was appropriately named by their father. The various scientists all over the continent theorized that their chakra looked and acted vastly different because their father's chakra, laced through and through with Yin chakra, toppled the balance of the yin slash yang kyubi chakra flowing through Kushina. The Uzumaki princess contained both chakra halves of the kyubi, but when Minato's large yin chakra content was added into the mix, the Kyubi chakra didn't recede but rather it merged with his chakra in their children. Naruto had gotten a more sinister color either by some luck of the draw or because he had the affinity to unlock the ghost speed release in him. That was the general, sane and logical assumption about the ghost flash twins. The other theory was that Rin was actually an angel and Naruto was actually a demon. But that couldn't be true, right? Right? Whether he was a demon or not the Kamui was 0.100 other zeros and a one times faster than his ghost speed. So, even though it was more of a race, the first thing Itachi did when his head popped out directly behind their target was to spit out three water bullets. Not at Orochimaru, but a little to his side, making him feel like he dodged them but he didn't. These bullets smashed against the trees he was about to enter, about three miles away from Kanoha now, and these trees abruptly fell in his path. Slowing him down so that Naruto, who now sported two pairs of red veined black wings, appeared in front of the Sanin and drove his fist into the older man's face, caving it in. The man was thrown away by the brutal attack and he rolled on his side limply, blood gushing out from every orifice on his face before he stopped, face first on the ground and showing no signs of breathing. Naruto still had his fan like wings open, but folded them when he realized that he might not need them, the wings folded flat on his back and melted away into red mist. Itachi and Naruto, with the barely alive Sanin between them, watched with mild irritation as the man hurled his own body out of his mouth, 
like a snake shedding its skin in a grotesque show of body horror, coming out good as new. Naruto then said. You have an annoying habit of running away, snake summoner. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I hurt your feelings? Was the sharp, sarcastic response from the man. Do you cry yourself to sleep knowing I'm the one that got away? He was goading Naruto, hoping that the jabs would throw him off his game. Naruto, though, wasn't phased by it. Rather, he held up on hand and flipped through twenty lightning fast hand seals before Orochimaru could even process what was going to happen. After the hand seals were completed, a hazy bubble of red chakra escaped his body and covered the other two highly ranked shinobi, going as far as a two mile radius with him at the center. Ninja art, spinning barrier of the revolving heavens. Orochimaru snorted in amusement. So, you trapped us in until you die, huh? He slowly clapped at this. I didn't know the Hyuga allowed outsiders to know and use their jutsu. It's not a Hyuga jutsu. Itachi droned, reminding Orochimaru of his presence. The black cloak the Uchiha wore over his standard Jounin uniform fluttered almost dramatically in the wind as he continued. It's a jutsu Lord Sandame created. He used it to contain the Kyubi when it attacked twelve years ago. But you're right. You have to kill him before it falls. Substitution jutsu and the body flicker jutsu wouldn't work. Are you ready to face your fate, Orochimaru-san? No, child, the real question is. He moved a little to the side so that he would see both of them and pulled up a sleeve to reveal the complex seals littered on his left. Forearm, Naruto's Sharingan could only note that it was a level 7 seal. Are you ready for yours? Both Sharingan holders narrowed their eyes in suspicion as he bit his thumb quickly and swiped over the seal. Summoning Jutsu, Sound 5. Six puffs of smoke burst from his sides and behind him to reveal six teenagers, younger than the two A-ranked teens, and in ready stances to attack at a moment's notice. Their eyes widened when they realized who their master had summoned them to fight. The Red Demon and the Crow. They didn't crumble under the gazes of the high-ranked ninjas though, and it was Kimimaro that spoke first. You will regret the day you were born, Red Demon. He pushed down the urge to call the red-haired Namike's Lord. The Red Demon looked over the young teens, two facing him and three, four, facing Itachi, and replied. Is this what you really want? To die for this man? We will gladly die for Lord Orochimaru. He was the one that gave us a purpose. Kadamaru said as his eyes trained on Itachi. But we won't be the ones dying here today. So be it, Itachi grunted. Meanwhile, Orochimaru watched the interaction with Glee, his servants would were the two down enough for him to attack and take their eyes. It was perfect. It wasn't perfect. The infamous red demon raised his left hand towards them and beckoned them to come at him. Taiyuya and Kimimaro barreled towards him and the others ran at Itachi. Do you really think Itachi and Naruto are capable of defeating Orochimaru? Kamina, leader of Hidden Marsh, asked the Hokage at his side as they watched the very last match, Mikoto vs Sasuke. I have no doubt they will. Naruto leaned back from the bone swipe to his neck and, quick as a flash, lifted his leg up to push the red-haired girl away when she came at him with a poison dagger. He uncrossed his arms and slapped three bones from the air, driving both of his palms into Kimimaro's chest. There was a resounding boom after he did so and dust blew around, where he raised an intrigued eyebrow at how easily the bone user shrugged off the same attack that would have killed any full-grown man. He didn't permit the boy time to gloat, his middle and pointer fingers, laced with red chakra, poked his neck and his forehead, dazing him so that Naruto could cock his fist back and drive it unforgivingly into his stomach, then a spinning kick to his cheek. He looked over his shoulder at the hesitant, foul-mouthed girl and narrowed his Sharingan eyes at her. Without wasting any more time, she summoned four giant monsters and controlled their thoughts and actions with the sweet music she was playing with her flute. You have so much faith in them, especially your son. Yumi added questionably as she swirled a cup of tea with a small teaspoon. There is a reason I want him to be Hokage, instead of maybe Rin or even Kakashi. Minato continued as he smiled brightly at his daughter when she used the flat of her claymore to clang against four throne kanai and ran head first at the attacking Achiha. Mind telling us why? The Kazakage droned as he divided his attention between watching the interesting fight and the leader's conversation. Well for starters, Naruto isn't just smart. He's a genius like none other. Myself included. A high praise couldn't be given. 
He was able to devise a way to sneak past chakra detectors in the entrance of a nightclub, especially with the large chakra coils he has, and murder a whole meeting of kingpins, fifteen in number, without notifying their guards of his presence. Naruto stepped away from a downward club from an adamant monster, seeing as it had witnessed its other comrades being beheaded by blows. Their bloody carcasses lay on their sides, littered around. The red demon ran under another clubbing blow and slammed his palm against the bulging belly of the attacking behemoth. A scorching hand mark appeared on the creature's back before the mark exploded, throwing out blood and guts in a straight line, splashing Taiyuya in the face. The boy allowed the creature to fall over, dead, as he idly began walking to the usually confident but now panicking girl. She was frantic for good reason. He had destroyed her summons in four minutes and he didn't even use more than mid in speed. Kamina whistled, impressed at the feat that is impressive, but that can't be the only reason. The blonde Hokage shook his head negatively. No, it isn't. Naruto's logical prowess in the field alone doesn't set him apart, rather it is also his intelligence when he assists me in the office. He has shown me that he wouldn't easily crumble under the pressure. The guards and his sisters listened to what the aging Namikaze said attentively. So far. He added under his breath. Why do you think he is so strong at such a young age? Shibuki, Waterfall's leader pushed. Minato shrugged. I'm not sure. I know why, if you don't mind me interrupting. Rin said, the chill leader nodded for her to speak. He uses his fear to push him to be the best at what he does. And what is his fear? The sand leader prodded. The girl smiled widely. I'm sorry, but I can't tell you that. Naruto's biggest fear was of him losing his family. He was now basically toying with them. Kimimaro, with his cursed seal of earth activated, was trying his possible best to at least get a tag in on the older boy. Naruto dodged all of his attacks, kicked the back of his knees violently and smashed his foot into the boy's spine unforgivingly. The blow didn't harm the bone user one bit, but rather it shook him, distracting him from seeing when Naruto flashed through 37 hand seals. Fire and wind release, Cooperation Jutsu, Flames of the Underworld. Crimson red fires billowed out of his mouth and washed over the bone user. His pain screams broke Taiyuya out of her daze. Fuck it, I'm gonna kill you 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 fucking piece of shit. She screamed madly and activated her cursed seal of heaven. Naruto kept blowing unbearably hot columns of fire on the bone user's prone body, idly keeping track of the girl. The abnormally red fire licked at the boy's skin and barreled through his lungs, leaving a path of burnt destruction in its wake. All the boy could do was lay on his back, his mouth wide open in horror that he was indeed going to die and that even if Taiyuya got to him on time he was still a lost cause. His skin fell off his bone in clumps, sizzling on the ground and that was when Naruto finally stopped pouring fire from his mouth, so that he could drive his knee up the girl's chin. Her neck snapped back harshly, a late realization of the futility of her last attack, and she fell back like a tree, a motion so fast she doubted it ever happened. But the proof was the consciousness leaving her and her beating heart thumping slower and slower. The red demon looked at them impassively and cancelled the Sharingan Genjutsu he had on them from the very beginning. The fire that burned crackled and went off to reveal that the bone release user was also unconscious. Didn't they know that looking into the eyes of a Sharingan user was not advisable? I'm proud of my daughter, Rin, as well. She didn't just let her brother rise up through the ranks. She rose up too but I also have to consider whether or not she would be ready to become Hokage. The Hokage echoed as Sasuke threw two kicks at his youngest daughter that connected to her right shoulder and a final kick that hit her ear. The girl fell down face first into the ground, her deadly weapon still tightly grasped in her hands. Rin has shown that she can be all business but she also has a streak for illogical thinking, nothing severe or harmful to her performance in missions. I'm talking about in diplomatic relations. The blonde girl sheepishly ducked her head when her father said this. That's why I send Naruto on those sorts of missions instead of her. She may have a way with words but she also wears her heart on her sleeve. He sighed in relief when his daughter rolled away and flipped back to her feet, her face very much worse for wear but ready to fight again. Naruto allowed a water clone to melt out from his side as he looked back at the Sanmin, who was grinning ear to ear at him. I would have expected them to be better, and I expected you to kill them. They have potential to be great shinobi. I will kill them only when they are irredeemable. He said mechanically as he closed his left eye, the Mangekyo Sharingan spun to life in his right. You have two options, he said as the air hummed with restrained power, ebbing out from the teenager's very being. 
His Mangekyo remained still and his eyes weren't yet bleeding but the strong gaze he leveled at the man would have delved any other person into hysteria. Orochimaru refrained from looking into his eyes. Come back with us, dead or alive. Which do you choose? The man realized that he couldn't make the mistake of underestimating Naruto again. So he got into a strong snake fist taijutsu stance and his arms transformed into white twin cobras, each on hissing venom at the boy. His answer was predictable. You'll just have to wait and see. Naruto got into his own clan taijutsu stance and his mangekyo slowly began to spin, not blindingly fast but still fast enough and red mist covered his arms. Two red mantis susano claws covered his arms, the serrated teeth were black and the rest bubbled with red chakra. Itachi effortlessly dispatched his opponents and ordered a clone to tie them up as he trained his eyes on both fighters. He wasn't going to interfere out of respect for his longtime friend. Naruto is not only mentally strong but also physically strong as well. Even though his is not the strongest, physically, in Konoha he has shown that he doesn't always need strength to win a fight. Minato continued, watching as twelve barbed golden chains slithered out of his daughter's back each one pointing at Sasuke while the girl herself pointed at him with her claymore. Her body was riddled with small scratches and bruises. All the while Sasuke, armed with two extra long kunai, prepared to run at her, he too looked like the fight had taken a toll on his body, as much as it did with his rival. His two Tomo Sharingan were worrying blazingly in his eyes as he grit his teeth under the effort of reading her. I have personally seen when he bested a comrade in a spar with just four punches and two kicks. A right-fisted uppercut, two left hooks, a heel kick to the side of the head, a kick to the sternum and finally a punch right across his opponent's face. There are only a handful of people that can really push him to his limits. Rin, Kakashi, Guy, and him. Not all at once but it was still an impressive feat. Rin might have been my first choice as Hokage, but Naruto is my final choice. He might need more training and experience to finally become Hokage, and I still have a few more years to go but I'm confident he will be ready to take the post. And I will stand by him till the very end. I promise, Naruto. Rin swore in her heart. She supported Naruto through everything and she wasn't jealous that he would become Kage instead of her. He had been there for her, for them, through thick and thin. Long ago, her father had confided in her that even when Naruto became Hokage, he would still need her to help him. She was years ahead of him with that idea. The older Namikaze knew that, even though Naruto was much stronger than her, when they fought together, she brought out the beast in him and he brought out the monster in her. Naruto, with one eye still closed, ran at his opponent just as Orochimaru did. A cobra reached forward to Naruto, purple, cursed chakra filled its harshly hissing mouth and a mantis claw slashed down at him, black chakra leaving a trail in its wake. No one could feel the resounding boom as the attack made contact. Chapter 4 what happens when two stars collide? First a vacuum briefly sucked everything in, as the snake sage clashed against the red demon. A quarter of a second where the forest inhaled a sharp breath in anticipation and there was utter stillness in the air. Then, boom! Itachi shielded his eyes with his right forearm and an ethereal ribcage spiraled outward around him, covering the unconscious children Orochimaru had sent after them. Naruto's jutsu, the shell-like dome that was only meant to disintegrate if or when Naruto was killed, shattered like stained glass. The shards of the unbreakable jutsu shredded trees and foliage, battering against the Uchiha's incomplete Susano. Inside the ribcage, Itachi bent his knees and positioned himself into the violent gale, digging his chakra deep into the ground to fix himself in place while the sound four were thrown off the ground and were now firmly stuck to the back of Itachi's Sharingan. Construct. The light was blinding. The great exhale was deafening. Itachi didn't dare look directly at the contact point between Naruto and Orochimaru, since that might as well have been like looking directly at the sun with his mangekyo activated, which it was. Naruto pushed away with gnashed teeth, switching his feet and diving back in as Orochimaru too bellowed toward him. The mantis Susano arms covering his own arms clinked against the fangs of Orochimaru's arm snakes, grating like jagged nails on a chalkboard. The Namike's genius pulled his arm away and swung his other hooked claw in a nimble blur of speed, severing the heads of the Sanin snakes and following up with a deft spin on his left heel with a hard hook kick with his right foot. Thud. Crazed, Orochimaru blocked the attack with his forearms. He blasted Chakra to his arms and pushed back, surprising the 17-year-old speedster. Regaining composure, Naruto stepped back into the fight with a hard swipe of his right claw. 
Dodged by the man with a quick lean away and forcing the older shinobi to follow through with a roll as Naruto made to trip him. The headless snakes that were his arms sizzled with heat, still hot from their decapitation, though the sanmin forced his arms to return to him as he rolled again, avoiding a lethal slash that scorched the ground red. Naruto's body vibrated, shedding red-black chakra as he quickened his pace. He leaped to Orochimaru, a brazen attack if he had been any slower. The Namike's feet snapped down three revolving bicycle kicks, stepping down on the sage's face with both feet and smashing Orochimaru's head squarely into the ground. Thumb. The sage's head broke like an egg against the hard ground. Hastily, he cut off the downed man's legs, only to realize the Sanmin had once again replaced himself with a reptilian clone. Dead with an open skull, Naruto's Mangekyo flicked up, noticing the utter decimation of the forest, totally leveled of plant and animal life in a clean two-mile radius. He saw his target as he just about slithered into the forest at the western edge of the radius, retreating in the form of a white humanoid snake. Itachi. Naruto grit, his evolved Sharingan eye weeping a trickling stream of blood from his right eye. He dispelled his Susano arms and looked to his rival, who was now ragged on his knees, eyes also bleeding. The Uchiha shouted, waving him off with both hands. Go. Getting confirmation that his friend was fine and that he could take care of the sound for, Naruto closed his right eye and opened his left. Two pairs of wings fizzled from his upper and lower back, somehow not tearing his shinobi uniform. Both wings were thin and semi-transparent with a thin film of red chakra, red chakra vein spiderwebbed each of the four wings. Naruto held back from completely transforming, restraining his mangekyo and his summoning ability to his wings. He faced where his target had escaped to, his senses tracking the man as he dipped straight under the trees in a frenzy of self-preservation. Orochimaru had now entered Earth Country, but border politics was the last thing on the Hokage's son's mind. Naruto's wings trembled noisily. Bzzzzzzzzz, pomph. One moment, Orochimaru was meandering trees and roots, panting at the demon chasing him, and then the next he was tackled from behind, spun around and body slammed into the ground. The shockwave spread far and wide. Sasuke heaved, stumbling back half a step after delivering the wrestling move to his teammate. Mikoto laid spread eagle on the ground, surrounded by a dozen of her chakra golden chains and a cobweb of broken earth caused by the sheer impact. She was panting, eyes closed and teeth gnashed at the pain of her back. Give up, idiot. The Uchiha boy spat, his two Tomo Sharingan swirling dizzily in his sockets. Absolutely positive that the person he had body slammed was the red demon's baby sister and not a shadow clone. When the girl didn't respond, and amid the utter silence of the arena, Sasuke yelled. I said, give up. Rin frowned. Dad. She muttered to her father, but the Hokage shook his head. Hold on, his stare was fixed on his daughter, laid out on the ground and staring straight up at the ceiling of the arena. Her expression was a mix of shock and tiredness, displayed clearer when her chakra chains dispelled. Mikoto, I don't want to hurt you anymore. Sasuke swore, stalking to his unresponsive teammate, standing away from her with his two long kunai clenched his hands. He looked to the proctor. Call it. Grim, Hei pursed his lips and ready to call the winner, until, get up, Mikoto. Shocked silence. Flushed harder than she had ever flushed, Hinata leaned forward on the railing and screamed loud enough for her Byakugan to flicker on and off. Get up, Mikoto. The surprised stares of her teammates and friends didn't dissuade the shy heiress. Over in the Kage's booth, Rin's brow was raised all the way into her hairline, amazed by the normally quiet girl's outburst. Minato shared her sentiment, and so did the entirety of Hinata's clan, gaping and wide-eyed at the princess's scream. You can do it. Her voice echoed. Get up. Mikoto's face twitched. Sasuke bared his teeth. The youngest Namikaze breathed out and rolled onto her front, keeping her hands under her and pushing, getting up to one knee. In spite of himself, her teammate watched, amazed and infuriated. The arena was still silent, watching the Hokage's daughter rise to her feet, chin low, shoulders hunched and eyes narrowed to the ground. Her red hair frizzed, breathing raggedly, opening and closing her fists while they hung at her sides. She looked. She looked like a cornered beast. Yes. Hinata cheered, arms raised as if she herself had won the match. Sakura added her voice, again to the shock of other observers. You've got this, Mikoto. Kakashi chuckled and closed Kurinai's open mouth, much to Asuma's amusement. Kiba joined in. Get him, Mikoto. Akamaru howled in support. 
Mikoto Uchiha, amused and bemused, called to her son. Finish this, Sasuke. Her son glanced at her, then to his father. Fugaku nodded once. The arena divided itself between supporting Mikoto Namikaze and Sasuke Uchiha, roaring to life once more at the conclusion to this year's Chunin exam. Mikoto felt her hip for her claymore, grasping at nothing and recalling that she had been disarmed not too long ago. She unclipped the heavy sheath and allowed it to fall carelessly to the ground. She sighed, rolling her neck back and flicking a short look to the Kage's booth, catching her big sister's strong look and the hardness of her jaw. You should have stayed down. Sasuke muttered, discarding his kunai and clapping his hands together before his chest. I'm Uzumaki, Sasuke. Mikoto half smiled, shoulders lifted a little to shrug. I don't know how to stay down. Here, Minato smiled. Mikoto formed a seal with her hands. Shadow clone jutsu. Poof poof. Sasuke started flipping through a short set of hand seals. Two clones appeared on each side from a thin burst of white smoke. She held out her right hand, supported at the elbow with her left, and the clones immediately began swiping their hands over the palm, depositing chakra while the real Makoto swirled the dropped chakra in her hand. Realizing what his daughter was doing, Minato turned to his other daughter, only to see the absolute astonishment on her face as well. Gan. The two mouthed, looking back at the fight. The two genin barreled to each other, their jutsu complete. Gan. Chidori. Chakra billowed on contact. Naruto's wings evaporated with a grunt, devolving his Sharingan and ultimately deactivating it. He stood over Orochimaru, immobilized with a broken back, looking down at the paralyzed Sanin with both eyes open. Capillaries surrounded his irises and blood leaked from the corners of his eyes. He controlled his breathing, smoothing down the front of his jounin vest, only for his hand to find a blade hilted in his gut. The grass cutter long sword. Orochimaru began laughing, physically unable to move from the neck down. Who's the genius now, brat? Naruto coughed, thin blood dribbling off sides of his mouth and falling down to a knee. Kukukuku. The Namikaze grabbed the handle of the sword and tugged it out, having to prop his left hand on the ground after when he was about to fall on his face. He tossed away the poison-coated weapon with a choked breath, feeling his lungs fill with blood and his throat constrict. He coughed blood again and his vision blurred. Kukukuku, if you have to die for me to go back to Kanoha, I'll gladly go back. Regardless of his paralysis of his limbs and the hollow numbness from the several points along his back that his spine had shifted apart, like a broken snake, the sage could only feel the purest form of joy and accomplishment at the feat he had performed. Fatally wounding the red demon was a legend even death itself wouldn't believe. Rather, Naruto hummed, wearing a dangerous smile and staunching the stab wound with his palm. I wonder, G-U-H, the wound oozed freely, flooding his organs and muscles with a deadly cocktail of poisons. He stood up with a huff, burning purple stare turned down to the smug San Mean, the smugness began to lift when the red demon began a constant vibration of his internals, guarding them from the scathing touch of Orochimaru's brand of poison. He willed his blood to gather up all trace of the poison, pulling away the tentacled creature unleashed on his insides and squeezing liquid death into a tiny pebble, moving it outside of his stomach. I wonder, if death is strong enough to drag my soul to hell. Sasuke stood over Makoto, plain-faced at the mangled state of his teammate's right arm. He looked within himself for something, an emotion, a feeling. Regret. Remorse. Worry. He didn't feel any of that. He felt nothing, and he felt pride. He proved his point to Naruto. The Uchiha bent down to his teammate, a secretive smirk playing on his lips as the QB holder remained oblivious to his achievement, unconscious to the world. Sasuke's next words echoed in the delirium of her slumbering mind. I beat you, Mikoto. He whispered, speaking so low and so privately no one could read his muffled lips. I told you to stay down. The proctor called the match in his favor. Winner, Sasuke Achiha. A chorus of applause raised the roof of the arena. Oh, oh, oh. One hour later, Mikoto masterfully tuned out the dull droning of her family's personal physician, her cerulean eyes looked firmly at the clock in her hospital room, counting the seconds in her head. Tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock, tock. Miss Mikoto. The weathered doctor grumbled, leaning his elbows on his knees and frowning from behind his bridged fingers. The girl blinked, briefly startled at the reminder that she wasn't alone in the room, though she didn't turn to look at the frustrated doctor. The bones of your arm have been set and natural healing is underway, Thankfully for you the aching in your back should subside with time. 
He added the last part with whispered grunt. As long as you take your pain medication, keep your arms stable and refrain from strenuous activity, you'll be fine. The girl pursed her lips and hummed, sitting oddly still on the hospital bed. Emichem. The girl had been changed out of her ninja attire to a simple white shirt and black shorts with a pair of blue shinobi sandals. Her clothes and weapons had been taken away to be cleaned, leaving her kanai and shuriken pouch strew at the foot of the bed. Her shoulder-length red hair was still unruly, but not from the fight since the nurses had helped her wash her hair. Combing it, on the other hand, was too much of a pain for the girl, not with those flimsy combs the nurses used. She had a cast on her right arm and fingers, secured close to her gut with a neat sling. For a moment, the old doctor stared at the silent girl, unsure of where to go from there. He turned to his left and looked to Itachi, wedged in a corner of the room with his hands tucked into his pockets and so far non-speaking since his appearance fifteen minutes ago. He looked even more tired than he usually did, with heavy shadows under his eyes and a ghostly pale complexion marring his thin face. I'll be taking my leave now. MHM, Mikoto mumbled, unthinking as she casually swung her dangling feet. The doctor nodded to the 17-year-old Jounin before exiting the room, leaving the near catatonic girl to the Uchiha to deal with. Tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock, tick. With practice steps, Itachi made his way to his friend's youngest sister and took a seat on the bed, using a moment to get comfortable on the hard mattress. He set his hands on his knees and sat upright, rigid and clearly still uncomfortable. The girl didn't respond, stormy blue eyes fixed on the clock, counting the seconds. Flicking a short side eye to the girl, Itachi cleared his throat. I heard you fought spectacularly against my brother. This time, he didn't get a mindless grunt from her. It's all my mother's talking about. Not exactly in her goddaughter's favor, but Itachi didn't feel like mentioning that. I regret not being there. Emichim. The prodigy exhaled, tired of the girl's coldness, even though he was often this cold to others. Listen, Mikoto, it's not your brother's fault for not being at the finals. We were sent on mission to catch that crazy ninja that attack you, Sasuke and Sakura, in the forest. Orochimaru. I guess the mission's declassified now that he's in custody, there was going to be an invasion during the end of the exams, and Intel Naruto and Rin found out put a stop to the invasion. The usually quiet teen stopped his rambling, screwing his lips to the side when he realized he was making excuses for his friend. The closeness of the three Namike's siblings was strange to outsiders. Finally, he said. What I'm saying is that Naruto was busy. Mikoto stopped counting the seconds, bringing her eyes down to look at her idol. I don't mind that big brother was busy. High-ranked ninjas in Kanoha are busy by profession. Their skills were in constant demand and expectations were always high. At least Rin had been present to watch her get her ass handed to her. Doesn't stop me from being disappointed I lost. It might as well be a clan thing. Namikaze didn't lose. Namikaze didn't fail. Namikaze didn't disappoint. Mikoto had been born into a family of superhuman winners. A genius from a young age, the QB holder succeeded in everything she put her mind into, academics, training, and missions. Itachi gave a breathy chuckle, yes, he knew about the Namike's pride. It was carbon copy of the Uchiha pride. Dad's not here, big sis isn't here, just you. Well, excuse me for caring. The Uchiha scoffed with false offense. The girl rolled her eyes, looking back at the clock. Emichim. Mikoto, how can you be better if you don't fail? Emichim. I've heard a million and a half seminars like that back in the academy. Something in her stomach stirred at the constant reminders from Irika and some 10,000 guest speakers that came to the class to talk to them about the ninja experience, she mentally air quoted with another roll of her blue eyes. It's not about how you fall but why you get back up, failure is all in the mind, you're only human, believe in yourself and you can achieve anything. She said the last part with faux bravado, mimicking the guest speaker, who was apparently a retiring Akimichi ninja that was branching into becoming a life coach. You don't get it. Itachi, I don't lose. She pointed the thumb of her good hand at herself, berating. I don't care if it sounds selfish, but I don't. Lose. Itachi sighed, a small, wistful smile playing on his lips as he looked at his rival's baby sister. I've been fighting since the day you were born, Mikoto. Losing is part of life. She was reminded again that her idol had been a clan prodigy since before he was five years old protecting a newborn baby Sasuke from the ravages of the nine-tailed fox. B. 
Being 17 now, Itachi was still a prominent shinobi in his clan. And about that thing about not know how it feels to lose, he started, rounding back on that statement. I've known your brother since before we could walk. An image of the two came to mind. One infant, an energetic redhead with fiery purple eyes, and the other, a dull child with coal black hair and an even darker stare. Naruto's twin sister, Rin, spent most of their childhood in present-day feuds being a mediator. For the moment the two children locked eyes, an intense rivalry was ignited. Itachi counted it down for Naruto's sister. Naruto learned how to talk before me, learned how to walk before me, learned his clan fighting stance before I could learn mine, activated his Sharingan before mine. And let's not mention that even though I've beaten his sister in a fair spar, I still haven't been able to beat him in one-on-one -on -one combat. Seventeen years, and I still can't win against that guy. He almost sounded like he was venting. Mikoto was taken aback by the rush of information, amazed that in spite of his sizzling irritation, Itachi's annoyance didn't last long, it simply melted off his body. That doesn't stop him from being my closest friend. Although he was hesitant to call his rival his best friend, Itachi could at least acknowledge that. I learned from all of my losses, Mikoto. MHM, though this time, the girl accompanied the grunt with a fractional nod, reflective of what she had been told. Going to leave, Itachi opened the door just as Hinata contemplated entering. Leaning to the side on her bed to see around Itachi, Mikoto's glazed eyes brightened at the sight of the heiress, easing herself around the brooding Uchiha and turtling her chin into her puffy hoodie. Oh, hey. Hinata. Ichichai. Not thinking too much on it, Itachi left the girls alone. Standing awkwardly at the door, Hinata scuffed her left heel on the ground, poking her fingers together and blushing a strong shade of red. Mikoto would have been worried about the redness of her former classmate's face if she wasn't so used to seeing if, and also if she also didn't feel so gawky in that room. She hopped off the bed and self-consciously smoothed down her shorts as she landed, rubbing at a spot on the left side of her pants where there she didn't find a pocket. The ticking of the clock now felt like a timer, where each click increased the stuffiness of the room, wearing on both girls until Mikoto tried at a nervous smile. Thanks for, um, you know, she awkwardly patted her left side with her good hand. Cheering me on. During the exams. It, it really means a lot to me, Hinata. Her face faltered, turning her eyes down. A and I'm sorry for losing. I did my best. I really did. Unexpectedly, the purple-haired girl was quick to console her, taking two remarkable steps to Mikoto and reaching out with a hand until she caught herself. Fingers curled back in restraint. I it's fine. I'm I am just glad why you did your best. Mikoto's head jumped up. But, th the match was amazing. Hinata interrupted, a shy smile tickling the corners of her small lips. The redhead looked doubtful, unconsciously smoothing the sides of her pants. She shuffled past her former classmate, getting redder by the second till she reached the hospital bed. Placing her hands on the bed sheets and wiggling her fingers in a cold starched fabric, an anxious substitute for her poking her fingers together. Impossibly, her stutter got worse and her voice got quieter with each uttered word. I I am sorry fff for my yelling, be back at th the e exams. Mikoto spat out a laugh, forgetting her mood. Hinata smiled at Mikoto's recovered delight, even as it was at her own expense. Oh my god, Hinata. The youngest Namikaze cried, slumping back on her bed and cackling. You were screaming so loud, ahahaha. Ah, ah. I thought, haha ha, I thought you bet money on our fight. This got a small giggle from the quiet Hyuga. And money? Yeah, like, a lot of money. The redhead's laughing reduced a little, wincing when she made to widen her arms on how much money she though Hinata bet on the final match. Ha 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 I was so scared you wanted me to pay you back. Hinata flipped to Mikoto, covering her mouth and eyes wide with shock. Her voice squeaked. Really? MHM, Mikoto bobbed her head, sitting up on the bed. I don't think I'd ever be able to get the money that made you scream so much. I mean, you're a princess, right? So probably a lot. Affronted at Mikoto's frankness, Hinata put her foot down. I, I didn't be bet any money. I, I don't bet. Good to know. The redhead scoffed, falling back on the bed, feeling a numbness from her broken fingers underneath the cast. You're always so quiet and you keep staring at me, so I kinda just assumed you were into some shady stuff, you know. SH shady stuff. At this point, Hinata felt like a parrot, repeating whatever the Namikaze girl said. 
Curiosity overcame personal dignity, prodding the Hyuga to ask. Oh like what? Eyes focused on the cream-colored ceiling, Mikoto said. Well, gambling, for starters. One time I saw you coming out from an alley, so maybe dog fighting. Or chicken fighting. Or drug dealing, maybe. Hinata was astounded Mikoto thought so, so, bravely of her. Gambling? Dog fighting? Drug dealing? Her. Hinata let herself laugh, free and breathy. Mikoto smiled at the sound. Am I right though? No the Hyuga heiress corrected despite her laugh. I was just dash. I I am just, just. Turning on her left side and catching the other girl's pale eyes, Mikoto helpfully supplied. Weird. Amazed again that she didn't take offense, Hinata smiled bashfully and shrugged. Mikoto gazed at the girl, brow furrowed with honest fascination and eyes swimming oddly. She screwed her lips to the side, wondering if or how she was going to word her next words. Hinata looked back at her with her eyebrows raised, retreating a little into herself. W what? I'd. Mikoto began, stopping to purse her lips. She opened her mouth soon after and began again. Can we, hang out more? Like, we can go weapons shopping. We could train. Spar, maybe. I, I can show you some of the manga I've been collecting. You can show me stuff you like too. Whatever you're into, I'm curious. Maybe you'll tell me what you were doing in that alley. We never spoke in the academy, you know. I, don't know why we never talked, you seem nice. Hinata's stomach bubbled with anticipation and her face lifted. I if that's wh what you want. Mikoto shook her head. Is it something you want? The last thing she wanted was to force this friendship. She didn't have enough people in the village she could call her friend. Her brother, sister and father didn't count. She was arguably popular back in the academy, but the people that flocked to her then and now were admirers. They gushed and they gaped and they gawked, yet they didn't bring anything meaningful to a conversation. Exactly the type of people Rin, her big sister, advised her to not to befriend. She waited for Hinata to reply, expectant and somewhat nervous. The heiress gave the girl a hopeful smile, beaming red and nodding jerkily. I'd like that, Mikoto. Oh, oh, oh. In another room, Naruto jogged on a treadmill, stripped of his clothes except for a pair his ninja pants and made to wear an oxygen mask over his face as he maintained a steady pace on the running machine while the wires strapped to his chest, abdomen and lower neck sent information to a computer, tracking his heart rate blood pressure and brain activity. The stab wound had been patched up and the internal bleeding had been controlled, bearing the striking white patch at the entry and exit points. A lab attendant stood on the right side of the treadmill, reading from a clipboard and another spoke lowly to the Hokage. Rin was on the other side of the treadmill, arms crossed and pacing. Kanoha's notoriously named physical chamber was a recent innovation brought in during the transition of leadership from the third Hokage to the fourth. Built in collaboration with Hidden Sand to test their shinobi on the present stage of their health. It was mainly used to find out if a ninja that had been out of commission for a long time was still primed to handle the rigors of a real life mission. On cue, the doctor with the clipboard held up four fingers for Naruto, and the red haired speedster nodded, prompting the doctor to tap a few buttons for the treadmill to incline. The Namikaze showed an active effort to maintain his jog on the simulated mountain. He didn't call on his true speed at the request of the doctors, it had been some years since he actually ran at any speed slower than a hundred miles per hour, and even now he was just pushing into forty miles per hour, leaning from a jog into a full sprint and visibly holding back from going further. The reality was that running slower than he was used to was more tiring than going at his actual speeds. Still, he wasn't even getting in a good sweat. He didn't see the point in this. He said he was fine. Just for show, he began shadow boxing as he sprinted up the treadmill. He sent forward two straight jabs, guarded his chin and threw a right hook, guarded again and leaned into a left uppercut, opening and closing his fists, driving down a right elbow and brought his guard back to his chin. Much to the lab attendant's irritation, he turned around on the treadmill and kept up the sprint, running backwards and giving his sister a wide shrug. His twin didn't look amused. That's enough. Minato barked. Shut it down. Yes, Lord Hokage. The attendant with the clipboard bowed, tapping a button on the treadmill and watching as the redhead sprinting on it slowed down. He began getting the wires off Naruto, mumbling. Show off. Naruto scoffed. He jerked at a small poke at the exit wound on his lower back. Easy, Rin. It's still sore. Exactly. 
The girl snapped, rounding on her brother. You were stabbed with this continent's most poisonous sword, made more so toxic because of that fucking snake. She touched the wound entry at the front, spreading her hand over it and having to tilt her head up somewhat to say discreetly. Take this seriously, Naruto. I mean it. Your sister's right. Minato stepped in, dismissing the doctor and attendant from the room. The two bowed respectfully and exited, giving the Namikai's family privacy. Rin passed her brother a dark purple shirt and he put it on, running a hand through his unruly red hair and shrugging at his father's words. The Hokage wondered if his son had always been this cocky, or was he just noticing it now? The poison is still in your body, Naruto. And you can't pass it out through your organs because that will kill you. Naruto's lips became a thin line, looking back to his sister and seeing her face harden. Are you listening to me, Naruto? You can still die if Orochimaru's poison gets into your organs. Even now, Naruto maintained a rhythmic vibration around the poison to contain it. Then what'll happen to me? HM. Your sisters. How do you think you dying would make them feel? Minato was speaking as a single father worried about losing someone else he dearly loved, not as the Hokage afraid to lose a vital asset to the village. He looked at Rin again and he stilled at what he saw in her expressive purple eyes. Turmoil and heartbreak. The exact same thing that would happen to him if something like this happened to her, not to talk of her dying. He didn't know what he would do with himself if she died. A message passed back and forth between the twins, the older one imploring the younger twin to take the situation seriously. Naruto sighed and rubbed his face, admitting. All right, I'm sorry. Good. Rin nodded, a brief chirp in her tone. She turned to their father and asked. What do we do now? We can't just leave that poison in him, what if he falls asleep and forgets to keep vibrating? Naruto knew the answer before his father could voice it, and the older Namikaze spoke her name out loud just as Naruto interjected. Tsunade. No. The redhead speedster put his foot down. Absolutely not. Whatever issue you have with her is no longer relevant, given the situation. Minato said flatly. Rin pursed her lips at the Hokage's verdict, not much of a fan either. Naruto tried again. What about Granny Chio? Cranky old Granny Chio. Anyone but that drunk. That's final. The younger twin palmed his face, turning around and groaning not so quietly into his hands. I'll go get her. Rin stated, elbowing her brother with a growing smile. It's been years since we last saw Shizun, huh? She might still be crushing on you. Kami, stop it, Rin. Naruto breathed and his sister laughed, if Rin was going, then he was also inevitably also going to go. Finally, he turned back to them, saying, can I have some time to get my mind ready? That old drunk won't be happy to see me, I bet. Rin mumbled, looking away and whistling when her younger twin snapped his burning purple eyes at her. You don't have to worry about that. Minato waved away his concerns. Choosing not to comment on what had transpired between Tsunade and her godson before she left the village. He doubted the slug Sanmin was so quick to forget, and apparently Naruto hadn't forgotten either. The Hokage walked to the door. I'll be sending Makoto. Minato counted to two and shut the door when realization dawned on the twins. The two looked at each other, alarmed. Mikoto. Oh, oh, oh. I'm sorry, Miss Namikaze left some minutes ago with Miss Hinata Hyuga. A nurse diligently apologized, bowing once and relieved to see that neither Naruto nor Rin were angry at the news, rather the twins shared curious looks. If you'll excuse me. The nurse scurried off, leaving the two to speak. Hinata Hyuga. Rin wondered, looking up and then suddenly snapping her fingers. Mikoto's stalker. The one I told you did all of that ridiculous screaming. It took a second for her brother to register a name to a face, raising a skeptical eye until Rin reminded him. She's harmless. Still. Naruto mumbled, tapping his chin, fully aware of how wary he was being against unarguably the world's gentlest human being. His sister hooked their elbows and pulled him out of the hospital. Come on, let's go find them. Naruto followed after her lead, not really thinking about the looks they were getting, if not for their familial resemblance, they would have looked like a couple. The automatic doors of the hospital entrance breezed open, releasing the twins into the crisp summer day. The two strode out, looking left and right. Naruto felt the hairs at the back of his neck rise, relaxing when he recognized the chakra signature approaching them from inside the hospital, exiting briskly. 
Rin. Naruto. Shibi Aburame called, prompting Rin to turn them around to face the Aburame clan head. The man's brow had a few tiny beads of perspiration, wiped off by a clean white handkerchief. Other than that tell, no one would have thought the man was frantic, his overcoat was neat and unruffled, his sandals were clean and properly strapped on. His hair was its normal angle of spiky, and his circular sunglasses were positioned firmly over his compound black eyes. Rin wanted to ask the problem, but the man spoke first. I'm glad to see you are well. News travels fast. Rin commented. Her left arm stayed hooked to Naruto's right, placing her other hand on her hip and speaking in a simmering tone, frustrated but thankfully not angry. I thought the health report of all Kanoha Shinobi were classified as private, clan or clanless. Except to the Hokage and the council, in special cases. Shibi finished quoting the village's founding charter. Since Naruto is a rank on his own, and you two are S rank as a team, his health has become a council matter. Naruto bristled, his purple eyes sizzling to turn red. It sounds impersonal and invasive, but that's how things are. Believe it or not, you and your sister are a strong deterrent for Hidden Rock waging open warfare with this village. The rakage has a lot of respect for Rin, and by proxy, you too Naruto. Kumo's positive facing neutrality is profitable from an economic and political point of view. Not many people could boast of being the rival of the Lightning Kage. But Rin's flash step bloodline forced I to forget about his rivalry with Minato on the two occasions they had clashed. Another story for another time. The twins at least appreciated Shibi's forwardness. It was sometimes a breath of fresh air to hear the reality of things. The Red Demon and the Angel of Kanoha were assets on their own. The Ghost Flash were heavy deterrents. Doesn't make it any better. Naruto sighed, rolling his head on his neck. He put on his best face and eased his temper back. What can I do for you, Lord Shibi? I have found a prime candidate for my clan's praying mantis nest. The twins found their eyebrows up and their eyes doubtful. The clan head reached into the darkness of his coat and took out a file, attached to the front with a paperclip was a colored passport of a crying child. Not the best or most convincing picture. The emotionally neutral insect holder admitted, showing some small measure of weariness in his shrug. But it's the best we were able to get. Naruto collected the file and opened it with both hands, moving it between himself and his sister. His name is Aku. Four years old. Orphan. We begin implanting the nest next week. Says here his parents died from prolonged QB chakra radiation. Naruto voiced and Rin's brow creased. That form of radiation was internationally known to be a fate worse than death. Reading on she realized why the village authorities and the Aburam clan council didn't mercy kill Aku's parents to put them out of their misery. Says here, they didn't show signs of radiation until Aku was one. Rin mumbled, her frown falling deeper and deeper, reading the report. They were quarantined for some days after the Kyubi attack, released, then quarantined again three years ago when Aku was born as soon as they started deteriorating. The mother went first, and the father followed. A deep scrub of the clan compound and there is no discovered trace of radiation. Our scientists think that the healer beetles the parents hosted miraculously subdued the radiation. These healing properties were passed to Aku, making his chakra and his body resilient to Kyubi's radiation. Amazing. Naruto whispered, baffled the more he read. How has the nest reacted to his blood and chakra? Favorably. Was the man's short answer. Snapping the file shut and handing it back to the man, Naruto said. That's all good and fine, Lord Shibi, but why are you telling me this? Seems you forgot my request from last month. Busy as you are, I can't blame you. The man said, tucking the file back into his coat. I would appreciate it very much if you trained Aku. Personally. Recalling he request, Naruto repeated his follow-up question. What can I possibly teach him that your clan isn't well equipped to show him? It is well known in my clan the calamitous depths of your praying mantis summons, Naruto. Although a small reflection, the mantis queen you lent our clan has displayed potential to replicate your summons, albeit to a far lesser degree. Gold leaf praying mantis, Naruto's summons, were an apocalyptic species of mantis. Chaotic. Frenzied. Bloodthirsty. Highly matriarchal. When unleashed, they brought about the end of lives, livelihoods, and ecosystems. One thing people understandably forgot about Gold Leaf Praying Mantis was that when they found a worthwhile summoner, they were deathly loyal and infinitely obedient. 
They provided Naruto secrets and their allegiance, and Naruto provided them two things. His chakra and his blood. It was, for lack of better words, a fair trade. The Mantis Queen and her nest in the Aburame clan showed signs of this scrutiny. Though the loyalty was yet to be seen since no previous person to have signed that contract lived to tell the tale. It was possible that the Mantis nest were calm enough to be frequently used, more so than the broiling mass twisting inside Naruto's summoning contract. As we speak, my clan's best seal masters are writing a summoning realm that can and should hold the Queen Mantis nest. The queen herself would reside in the boy's heart. A gruesome truth was that being seated in the heart, the queen would have easy access to both blood and chakra. Laying her eggs and nurturing her soldiers from that ticking throne, all the while refraining from taking too much from the host. Since the gold leaf are an extension of yourself, and the queen is an extension of the gold leaf, then Aku would soon be an extension of yourself. Independent and free thinking, yes, but an extension nonetheless. You said so yourself. Naruto mulled this in his mind. Who better to teach the child restraint? Naruto hummed. We're willing to pay. The redhead scoffed. Don't do that, Lord Shibi. He looked to his twin and the two held a wordless conversation with their eyes. Purple meeting blue, flickering back and forth messages. In exchange for teaching the kid, I want you to owe me a favor. What favor? The clan head prodded, standing more upright that the red demon was agreeing to his proposition. Rin answered. To be determined. Something might come up and will need your support. Nothing compromising to your clan or its privacy, Lord Shibi. We swear. Naruto vowed on their behalf, hinting that both he and Rin were going to teach Aku restraint. Even though she didn't have a summoning contract of her own, Rin played a big part in reminding her brother of his humanity. The proposal of having two A ranks teaching a clan made of his was too good to be resist. The twins caught the muted smile on the man's expression. Deal. Naruto and Shibi shook on it. Drop by when you can to see the boy. The Aburame clan head said as he released Naruto's hand. It'll be good if he familiarizes himself with your faces. Both of you. Definitely the two spoke together, two used to occasionally speaking simultaneously to catch the seamless synchronism. It was vaguely haunting when they kept doing so, saying. Expect us tomorrow. Tomorrow evening, if nothing comes up. Of course. He nodded to the twins. Rin. Naruto. He went off to their right, no doubt back to the clan compound to check up on the person he hoped would bring widespread recognition and appreciation for the Aburane clan. The twins stood for a moment, deciding where to look for their sister. They decided to check home first. Naruto and Rin vibrated, the former wafting a thin mist of red from his form and the other expelling muted yellow lights from her skin. Elbow in elbow, they made to step forward and vanish in a blur of their specialty speeds when, Sir, Sir, Rin groaned and Naruto chuckled, poking her side. The two turned to their left and saw Sasuke running up to them, his parents staying put where they were some yards away. His white pants and blue shirt were dirty from the fight, and his right knuckles were taped, a sign that Makoto's Raisingan didn't leave him unaffected. His parents watched on as their son skidded to a stop before the twins, doing his best not to pant and standing with a rigid back. Naruto gave the boy a friendly smile, driving an elbow into his sister's side when she sent the boy a sneering smile. Sasuke. He said, looking over the boy with his Sharingan to see that any injury was being managed, deactivating his Jujitsu. Congrats on winning the Chunin exams. You made me proud, kid. To show the sincerity of his words, and that there weren't any hard feelings for the boy beating up his baby sister, Naruto held out his left fist to the boy. No one knows exactly when using the left hand to shake or fist bump became so, revered. Reserved for family in anyone deemed highly respectable, whether in the ninja or civilian world. Anything done with the right hand was considered formality, business partners shaking hands, teammates exchanging fist bumps after a good training session, and begrudging enemies agreeing to lay down their arms for the sake of peace. Greeting with the left hand was different. It signified a higher form of respect. Less so adoration and more than appreciation. It was an honored gesture. Getting offered a fist bump by one's hero was a life-altering moment. Sasuke's expression showed it all, his eyes bugged wide enough for his Sharingan to flicker on and off, his shoulders slumped with weakness. His arms dangled absent-mindedly, his knees bent with what looked like the weight of the world, and his entire focus was on that one offered appendage. Then the boy inhaled, and that weight evaporated off his back. 
he took that fist bump with pride, meeting Naruto's fist with his left with a shaking tap. Something resembling a smile came onto Fugaku and Mikoto Uchiha's faces, the wife's more visible than her husband. Feeling the man slide his arm over her shoulders and pull her close, sharing that moment with their son. Although it had taken them a while to understand why their youngest son adored the male Namike's twin, they only had to accept it when they saw how the boy trained. Not even Itachi received the same recognition, much to the older boy's chagrin. Beating Mikoto Namikaze for the very first time meant a lot more to Sasuke than anyone could ever know. Thank you, sir. Sasuke nodded, making himself look taller than he actually was. That, ehem, that means a lot, sir. Sir, the twin parroted again in their heads. When did that start? You'll be heading for the tower soon to collect your chunin vest, right? Rin questioned, adjusting her stance to not seem so threatening, but that didn't help much with how hard she was glaring at the boy. Naruto had to dig his elbow into her side, coughing a glare at her and receiving a defiant raspberry in return. Yes, sir. Lord Hokage asked me to come to his office tomorrow. That's great, kid. I'll be there to cheer for you. Promise. The boy's pale face lit up and Naruto laughed, tousling his hair. Well, ah, uh, sir. Enough with the, sir, kid. It felt more than weird to be referred like that by his best friend's younger brother. You want help with something? Yes, Naruto, sir. Sasuke stood upright, pulling his shoulders back and tipping his chin up. He spoke confidently, like he practiced with his mirror. I would like to be your student. The twins' brows raced up. Naruto then quickly gained composure and glared his sister into silence when she was about to laugh. Basking in the hilarity of being proposed that question two times in the same day and also that Sasuke thought her brother would agree. Get your eyes to three Tomo, and we'll talk. She couldn't help but blurt. What? Naruto, you can't be serious. Really? Sasuke squawked. That's it. Naruto smirked. No promises. Maybe a few pointers here and there, nothing formal. Elevating from two Tomo to three was no easy or quick feat, it required obsessive dedication to improve and an unmatched drive to succeed. Besides, he was apparently now going to teach a four-year-old Aburame child how not to go insane with power. He had his hands full, Naruto suggested, motioning to his sister. Rin is just as strong as me. And her schedule's wide open. Hell no. He almost killed Makoto. Goddamn destroyed her arm. She gestured incredulously at the now grim Uchiha boy, mentally retreating into himself. The glow on his parents' expressions dulled. What's there to think about? It was a fight, Rin. A regulated fight. Naruto had to remind her. I nearly killed you in our own Chunin exam fight. Did you hate me? The teen stuttered, lost for words for a good five seconds. That's that's not the same thing, Naruto. Sasuke won fair and square. That's the end of that. He said, putting an end to her complaining. Facing the boy, he sent him a quick smirk. Remember what I said. He waved to Sasuke's parents, who momentarily were distracted, staring expressionless daggers at Rin, till they lifted they nodded. Are we still having dinner at your place, Uncle Fugaku, Auntie Miko? The Uchiha clan head didn't reply. Mikoto tried at a smile, the result looking lopsided and jagged. Why not? We can play charades after dinner. Come, Sasuke. Fugaku ordered, eyes fixed on Rin, even as the girl gulped and pointedly kept her eyes down. Home. Now. Sasuke wilted, paling at the man's tone. Yes, father. The two watched the Uchihas walk off, Sasuke's parents taking point at the boy warily slinking behind them. Naruto leaned to Rin, speaking from the corner of his mouth. If Auntie Miko poisons us, it's your fault. Screw you, Lord Red Demon. Rin swore, finding her defiance after being glared at by her Uchiha uncle. She said dramatically, While you're teaching that kid, why don't you visit Suna again for Lord Red Demon Day, Season 2? I bet that cult fan club of yours is waiting for you. Cult is a strong word. Naruto winced. Part of the month intermission after the first round of the Chunin exam was traveling to Suna incognito. The twins confirmed that there was an underground society of women in Suna that had encountered Naruto's stamina on some form of surface. It wasn't only made up of Suna indigenes but people that had caught wind of the whisperings and were interested in the second coming. 
It was a mystery how such a large and established society of people could remain hidden so completely, they had a treasury, a secret handshake, ID cards written with invisible ink, and, worse of all, their own scripture describing the first coming. It was graphic, all seven days, and all three rounds Naruto went around each lady that presented herself. The art was honestly impressive. The Suna worshipped Lord Red Demon cringed. And when will you let that go? I already apologized. Not enough, asshole. Despite her anger, she didn't unhook Naruto's elbow from hers. I want you to go back to Suna and disband that fucking cult. Pun not intended. If that's what it'll take to get you to forget about this, fine. Eyeing her brother, Rin scowled. Damn horn dog. Do you honestly think I won't go with you? None of those skanks are laying a fingernail on you, idiot. Fine. Naruto exclaimed, reducing his voice when they started getting looks. He pulled her to walk away from the hospital. No problem, okay. And we're having dinner tomorrow. And a movie. And you're giving me a foot massage. All right. Fine. Whatever you want. What if someone got pregnant? Huh? Rin continued ranting and Naruto groaned, deeper and longer, running a hand down his face. He nervously shrugged to an old couple passing by them. What if the condom broke and you didn't notice and now someone's pregnant, catching herself when she remembered that. Lord Red Demon Day was now nine months ago, she became paler than pale. What if you're already a father? HM, Naruto. Then what are you going to do, Naruto? You're too young to be a dad, Naruto. You don't have the money to be paying child support, Naruto. You can't be asking dad to help you pay child support, Naruto. Kami knows I'm not giving you fucking shit for child support. Kami, Rin, I didn't get on your case this much when you banged that samurai guy. Because you killed him. She hissed, baring her fangs and spitting venom. Naruto grimaced, recalling. Had him kill himself and hung him by his fucking balls. Literally, the image of a disemboweled man with a noose around his balls came to mind, creaking silently on pre-prepared gallows. His throat was slit open and his face was eternally twisted in grievous pain. The cover-up prevented an international situation. You learned carpentry just to hang that poor jackass. Naruto hiked his shoulders defensively. I mean, you can do better, don't you dare. Rin steamed, stomping hard and dragging her brother. Don't you fucking dare. Naruto mumbled something incomprehensible and Rin dared him to say it out loud. That's what I thought. Tired of being chewed out, Naruto picked up his sister and threw her over his shoulder, vanishing in a burst of red smoke. When anyone next saw them, Naruto wore an infuriatingly plain expression and Rin could hardly walk. Oh, oh, oh. they found Mikoto in the academy's playground. She was seated on the lonesome swing, still in the white shirt, black shorts clothes she wore in the hospital and with her casted right arm secured in a sling. At the foot of the tree and sitting with her back against the tree trunk, Hinata had her legs pulled to her chest and her chin resting on her knees. The Hyuga's Byakugan eyes were on Mikoto's, and the Namike's blue gaze looked into space, speaking to the quietly listening girl as she slightly swung back and forth. It's like having a second mind. She said and Hinata nodded quietly, brown knitted. Like a cheat code in my brain. Like a sixth sense. Or better yet, a seventh. Hinata shifted, putting her feet down and asking. A seventh? It's hard to explain. Mikoto strained a laugh, stopping her swung to scratch the back of her head. The princess smiled, a small, honest expression. You d don't have to t talk about it if you don't want to. W we can talk about s something else. Mikoto contemplated, shaking her head after. Nah, she brought her eyes down to her new friends, nervously looking down to the ground and pouting. I feel like, I can, you know, finally talk to someone about this. She laughed a little, resuming her swing and looking elsewhere. Even if you're probably not going through the same thing. Naruto and Rin pursed their lips. They didn't expect their sister to tell them everything going on in her life, and they tried not to crowd her all the time. Adding to the strangeness of that day, they hadn't ever seen Mikoto acting this, somber. They also didn't know she had any friends. It felt like this was a conversation they shouldn't be listening to, yet they did. I call it Kurama. Mikoto continued, stopping her swing and her face twisted with confusion. Or maybe it said I should call it Kurama, I'm not sure. She then added. Thing is, I didn't ask for its name, 
I just knew it, so I called it that. Kurama. She giggled, knowing what all of this must sound like. I swear, I'm not crazy. I, I know you're not. Hinata said, not missing a beat. Her eyes were wide with sincerity and openness, and Mikoto flushed. The Hyuga blushed too, saying, I, I might also have something like that, I, I in my head. She guardedly pulled her knees up to her chest, her red face whitening steadily and her expression falling to something vaguely resembling tiredness. I, I, she stammered, but Mikoto waited. Ever patient. Ever smiling, nodding for her new friend to go on. I, I, I it tells me, to H who hurt people. K kill people. Bernie everything. She looked to the Namike's girl, eyes glazed with unwept tears and pleading. I, I don't w want to hurt a anyone, Emikoto. Hinata didn't know what to expect from revealing her biggest secret. Disgust, maybe. Fear, definitely. What's it telling you now? Mikoto asked. Hinata closed her eyes, her smile mournful. Th that you're you you using me. S somehow. Th that we're not a actually f friends. The red-haired girl frowned. Th that you n need to d die. Mikoto didn't move for some time, face grim and thinking. Until Naruto and Rin saw her stand from the swing and approach Hinata. Their sister eased herself down next to the noiselessly weeping girl, whose eyes were still closed. The twins recalled the night Hinata was kidnapped by the Kyumo delegation. Seeing her uncle Hizashi slaughter her kidnappers to the last person did terrible things for Hinata's mental state of well-being, she became quieter, more withdrawn, more observant, more guarded. The twins didn't need to confirm from Hinata's academy entrance psych evaluation to know that the little Hyuga girl was a very troubled child. Looking at how haunted Hinata was about her diabolic thoughts, Naruto and Rin wondered why she wasn't getting some sort of treatment. Hell, Naruto had watched his mother getting murdered by the very monster inside his baby sister and seeing his father physically break down as a result, had activated his Sharingan, warping his perception of mortality and destroyed his sympathy for other living creatures. His utter devotion to his family was matched only by his sisters and his father. Hinata was a troubled girl, yes, but the shadow whispering in her ear so far hadn't been able to push her into the abyss. Seeing how she looked at Mikoto, Naruto understood why she didn't succumb. After a long silence, Mikoto bumped her shoulder against her new friends. You're stuck with me, Hinata. I'm not going anywhere. Naruto and Rin stood back, proud of their baby sister's careful words. They left the two girls alone, deciding to properly apologize to Mikoto later. Oh, oh, oh. Kanoha's torture and interrogation department. Detention center for the criminally insane. Somewhere in the forest of death. Minato almost pitted Orochimaru. Almost. I would have thought you'd have me tortured, Blondie. Orochimaru mocked, strapped to a table slanted upright, able to level a laughing sneer at the Hokage as he strolled into his cell. He chortled when the prison doors were closed behind the oldest Namikaze. So, you are human after all. The prison room was a hole in the wall hewn from a dark grey bedrock. Ten feet deep, five feet wide and ten feet high, it was an isolated and claustrophobic coffin lit by a distant fluorescent light, flickering with age and disregard. The particular wing Minato had ordered Orochimaru to be sent to was one so deep underground and isolated from the living, waking world. It might as well be a suffocating space in solitary hell. The hundreds of other cells left, right and around Orochimaru was hollow and empty. The snake Sanin could just barely make out Minato's outline, hovering at the door and traced by the sliver of light creeping in from afar. His clear blue eyes were as bright as the morning sun, almost like it glowed in the dark. Coupled with his shadowy form and the two blue eyes shining at him, Orochimaru wouldn't be mistaken if Minato Namikaze was the Shinigami itself. And that wasn't very far from the truth. Or are you here to kill me yourself? Minato hummed, his arms at his sides. His vision made out the straitjacket the Sanmin had been tied in and that he had been shaved bald, losing his eyebrows and fangs also for good measure. The restraint seals crippling the sage would have been cruel on any other person. Aside from the straitjacket and the table Orochimaru was attached to, there wasn't much use in physically keeping him restrained. Naruto's last attack had severely shifted three bones along his spine, which cut a vital nerve at the base of Orochimaru's neck and above his pelvis. Minato had been so merciful as to order for the former rogue shinobi to be washed and clothed, but not so much as to have him get painkillers. But apparently, that wasn't needed. 
Orochimaru didn't feel any pain, he didn't feel anything, to think this was Kanoha's most feared missing ninja. The man that had stolen children, created abominations, threatened the Hokage's family, and selfishly raised a network of villages for the purpose of destroying his home village. There's no point wasting Kanoha's resources by torturing a madman. Orochimaru cooed. You flatter me, boy. For your crimes against humanity, against common decency, and against your home, I condemn you to spend the rest of your miserable days here. No snakes. No sage chakra. Alone in the dark. Till you wither and die. Is that so much as a punishment or a chance to recuperate? Delude yourself however you want. Minato shrugged, crossing his arms and glaring. Those four children you sent to fight for Utah Yuya called themselves the Sound Four are undergoing rehabilitation and agreed, on their own free will, to lead us to the hidden Sound villages they know. It had taken some effort on his own part but Minato had been able to do the mind-altering Fuenjutsu Orochimaru had used on them, and Inoichi and his most trusted clan mates helped the Sound Four discern lies from reality. Chemical hypnosis made up a large part of any loyalty to the snake Sanin. There was remarkably no foul play involved. I'll admit you didn't make it easy for us. Minato nodded to himself. We'll finally be able to save all those children you took from this country. Orochimaru scoffed. How, Kanoha, of you, boy. Holier than thou like your predecessors, when in fact you all have done far worse. I didn't come here to debate who's worse or who's better. I came to say that I'm personally dismantling your machine, Orochimaru. As we speak, my ninjas are on their way to grass country. To Orochimaru's credit, his twisted sneer didn't change. I will find your allies, your enablers, and I will wipe them out. Believe me when I say this, dig too deep and the horde of monsters you find will eat you alive. Luckily for us, we have monsters of our own. Minato said. He wasn't talking about himself, he was talking about the S-rank team, Ghost Flash. He was talking about the A-rank ninjas under his command, Kakashi Hitaki, Asuma Sarutobi, Mike Guy, Yuga Yuzuki, Enko Mitarashi, and others. He dared the monsters Orochimaru spoke to brazenly about to do their worst. And in time, they will. You will never see the light of day, Orochimaru. Don't make promises you can't keep, Minato. Minato spoke over his shoulder. We're done here. The cell door snapped open and the ninja beside it bowed to the Hokage, while the man left. The door shut with a slam, a giggling Orochimaru imprisoned inside, and all of the Yandame's guards exited the ghostly silent underground floor. The solitary light was switched off and Orochimaru was by himself. Alone. Oh, oh, oh. Wave country. Haku knelt at a gravesite, feeling his thumb over the neat words etched on the slanted rock. Sabuza Momochi. Father. Mentor. Savior of wave country. Jammed into the earth behind the headstone was the fabled Kubikaribaku, Zabuza's larger-than-life executioner's blade. None of Zabuza's former comrades in the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist had come to claim the head cleaver, and Haku was glad for that. He could never have the strength to wield the blade. He and Team Kakashi hadn't been able to recover Zabuza's body from the sea. They searched for a full week and all they found was the Kiri missing ninja's forehead protector, which Haku no wore over his brow. The slash on the Haidaite showed prominently. It was a small comfort. The people of Wave also unanimously agreed to name the new bridge connecting Fire Country in Wave, the Zabuza Momochi Memorial Bridge, honoring the penitent man that gave the end of his life to protecting Wave. The massive structure soon became a vital nerve for Wave Kanoha relations, boosting the island's withering economy and improving lives. To think the demon of the hidden mist would die in such a way. Truly tragic. Haku didn't visibly show any surprise at his appearance, rising to his feet and subtly preparing to form icicles. The Mizukage thrummed, his greenish eyes dull and childishly young face turned down to Zabuza's grave. No need for wariness, child. I come in peace. Besides, if Yagura wanted Haku dead, he would have done that already. It was easy to mistake the man's petite stature for weakness, being just as tall as a thirteen-year-old Haku and looking just as young. It didn't relax Haku, not one bit. The emotionless holder of the three-tailed turtle gnashed his teeth. I said, stand down. The deep tremor of his voice darkened, and Haku forced himself to relax, bowing out of breath at the killer intent weighing on him. Yagura pulled his chakra back into himself and said. Good. What, do you want, Lord Yagura? Careful not to say something out of line, 
after all this same man had sparked several bloodline genocides in his village and had been the sole reason the seven swordsmen of the mist fled from Kiri. Haku's clan was erased because of this Mizukich. Yagura earned his moniker through decades of cruelty. Monster among monsters. Yagura held out his hands and swept them down his body, showing that he was unarmed. He then jabbed a thumb over his shoulder, directing Haku's eyes to his hook staff, hanging from a tree branch. I want us to talk. That's it for part 2. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.